A ruthless evil killer is on the run. With the death count rising, nobody was safe as panic and fear started to grip the general public. And yet police had no idea or clues as to where the killer could be. This is the sick and evil twisted case of Mark Hobson. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you may be in the world right now, hello, I'm Lloyd, and today you're watching When Evil Follows. Colleagues of Claire Sanderson have told police that she wasn't at work for several days before her body was found, and detectives here are now investigating the possibility that the sisters were killed at different times. Certain events in life defy any rational sense of logic, leaving us to question the undesirable or unimaginable question. What drives people to become a serial killer? I remember my school teacher telling me that there's no such thing as monsters, and that monsters don't really exist. But they do though. And so here's a true story of one of the UK's most brutal and feared serial killers. Mark Hobson was born in Wakefield Town on the 2nd of September in the year of 1969 in West Yorkshire, England. He grew up in a stable home with his two parents, Peter and Sandra, and his two older sisters, Melanie and Leslie, who loved him very deeply and were devoted to him, especially in the bigger sister role. His father, Peter, was a coal miner and his mother, Sandra, was in management. Mark had a seamlessly smooth upbringing with nothing odd or unusual standing out. He was a happy and bright kid. He did well at school and he seemed to get on well with his olders and he made friends with all the other children in school relatively easily. The year was 1994 when Mark Hobson would eventually find love. Shortly after that, marriage, a stable family life, with three wonderful children. However, just three and a half years later down the line, Mark walked away from the family environment and left the family home for good. Thinking and believing the grass is greener on the other side, Mark would soon find out leaving the family home was a massive, huge mistake. He was full of regret because he wasn't able and very much unsuccessful in winning his family back. And as his self-centered sickness kicked in and finally took its toll, Mark began drinking regularly and experimenting with heavy class A drugs. And now with no means of moving back into the family home, Mark Hobson's life began spiraling out of control and quickly. In search for the need of control and power, Mark finds employment as a nightclub bouncer in a town called Selby in Yorkshire. And it was in this new role Mark would find himself with the power over other people and was even more exposed to drugs, pushing Mark completely and totally off the rails. By this point in Mark's life, he was now in regular contact with primal quantities of drugs, ranging from class B to class A. And given his new sense of power as a doorman deciding who can and who can't enter the club would simply fuel him with even more aggression. And it was during this time in 2002, now aged 32, Mark Hobson was outside the local off-license in Selby when he lost all self-control over a disagreement involving a friend. Now the pair were arguing over a woman no less, who I'll add wasn't even sexually interested or active with either one of them. No figure. However, this argument did occur, finishing with Mark stabbing his friend in the chest no less than five times, actually piercing his lung. This was a vicious and violent assault, which left his friend with life-threatening injuries. Unbelievably, his friend managed to survive the horrific ordeal, but was too scared to inform the police on what actually happened that evening and who was responsible for his attack. And so the police had no choice but to close down the case. And Mark Hobson, no doubt, avoided arrest and a very long lengthy stay in prison. The date was now March in the year of 2004. Just one year after stabbing his so-called friend almost to death, Mark met a young and pretty woman who was just 27 years old and her name was Claire Sanderson. Now, Claire Sanderson was a young and beautiful woman. She was kind and gentle and more or less everything most men would desire and want in a woman. Their romance quickly grew and they and they both decided that, that they're gonna move into a flat together. And, and, and they did. The beginning of this relationship seemed to be one with potential. And that Mark was, you know, finally he was getting his life back together. He even found steady employment as a bin man. He was now off the drugs and everything was going swell. That was until Mark started stealing money out of Claire's handbag and purse. And sensing her vulnerabilities and playing on them, 
He then became quite violent and explosively bad-tempered within the relationship, turning everything that was once sweet into something quite sour. He very quickly fell into his old routine. He started drinking, he started doing drugs, and spending less time in his relationship. Whilst at the same time pushing more authority and asserting his power and control over Claire as to what she can and can't do. She essentially became a prisoner within her own home and at the same time she was very fearful of this different side to Mark that he'd managed to keep hidden from her for so long. Mark also had many sexual and unhealthy desires for Claire's twin sister, Diane. He just simply couldn't dismiss these sexual and emotional desires for Diane. And he would even try flirting with Diane in front of Claire, bringing shame to both sisters. Mark would even brag to associates in the local pub. Yeah, by saying how much of a mistake his relationship was with Claire and that he had picked the wrong twin and that one day he will take Diane and have her in every way he desires. And that really is quite an eerie and odd thing to say about your partner's sister. It was as though he was speaking about Diane like she was some kind of sexual object, one he owns and can pick up and put down, as to whenever he likes. And it was this type of behaviour that really showed and demonstrated his depravity, sadistic narcissistic side and Jacqueline Hyde personality, with a strong indication of a lower level of any respect for women in general. However, the dreadful reality was that Mark didn't want Claire anymore. In fact, Claire was just in the way of his affection for Diane, and eventually Claire was going to have to disappear, one way or another. And nearing the end of June in 2004, his overwhelming sexual lust for Diane was now completely uncontrollable. And so Mark begins taking the first steps in making this disgusting desire become a reality. Mark begins writing out a shopping list of all the things he's going to need in order to make his plan be successful. Got it. Black industrial bin bags. One roll of duct tape. One roll of black installation tape. A, a long, thick rope. Yeah, that will do it. One still heavy claw hammer. Industrial bleach. Two liters. Fuck it. Three. Three liters of industrial bleach. Perfect. And on the 11th of July, Mark Hobson would finally put his evil plan into action. Just after making love to Claire, he, um, he hit her around the head 18 times with a claw hammer. And as Claire lay on the bed, gurgling and coughing up blood with concussion, fighting for air, he then placed a bag over her head and suffocated her and strangled her to death. He then dragged Claire's lifeless body off the bed and then began to wrap her body up in black bin bags. The blood stains that were left on the bed mattress were obviously impossible to clean, so Mark simply just flipped the mattress over onto the other side and then makes the bed as if nothing had happened. After that, he drags the wrapped body along the hallway floor and dumps the dead body in the spare back room, leaving it there for a full week. And because the body was wrapped in plastic bin bags, the body was now decomposing at a rapid rate. And the, the smell of the decomposing flesh was now potent. It was actually infesting the rest of the house. And that's when Mark puts the next phase of his evil and disgusting plan into action. He sent a message from Claire's phone to Diane saying, Hi sis, I, I, I haven't seen you in ages. I'm currently ill in bed with glandular fever. I'm very sick. Please come and look after me. Diana turns up and she walks through the front door. And as soon as she walks through the front door, she's greeted by Mark who sat on the sofa watching TV. Diana then asks Mark about the strange foul smell in the house. Mark replies, it's because of your sister Claire. She's in bed and she's feeling very sick. You, you, should, probably, you should probably run upstairs and just uh, see if she's okay. You know, she's been asking for you. And with that, Diana rushes up the stairs and she walks into Claire's bedroom, but Claire's not there. Now, what happened next is the worst act any human could be possibly capable of. As soon as she turns to walk out of the bedroom to ask where her sister is, Diana was brutally attacked from behind. She was hit around the back of the head with a claw hammer, sending her to the floor with concussion. She was then dragged along the hallway floor by her hair and then dragged into the same room 
where her sister's dead body lay. And in front of her sister's corpse that was actually facing her, he then stabbed Diane in her arms and legs to slow down her movement and to stop her from running away. Mark then begins raping her on countless occasions before stabbing her in the chest and heart. And there's no doubt in my mind that Diana was made to suffer in pure fear and horror as she was raped time and time again in front of her dead sister's body. Diana was stabbed continuously all over her body, sustaining more than 45 deep and open wounds, ensuring her death was very slow and painful. Now after killing both girls, Mark Hobson, he, he goes on the run and he heads towards the city of York. He's now pretty much desperate and in need of food and shelter, and so he breaks into a small cottage home, belonging to an elderly cute couple. The elderly couple was Mr. and Mrs. Britton. James Britton was a retired former Spitfighter pilot from the Second World War, and his wife was called Joan. She was a retired teacher. She was deaf and almost completely blind in both eyes. So Mark breaks into the Britton's family home at around seven o'clock in the evening, and almost immediately, Mark grabs James Britton's walking stick and he hits him so hard with this walking stick, it snaps on the impact against the back of his head. Mark then runs into the kitchen and frantically he begins searching for a weapon. He starts opening the drawers and the cupboards. He eventually finds the knife drawer and that's when he chooses his selected weapon, a nine inch carving knife. He then runs back to James who's unconscious laying on the floor in the hallway and stabs him multiple times. Shortly after killing James, Mark hears Joan crying out for help. She had somehow managed to find her way out of her bedroom into the hallway, and she too was brutally stabbed to death. Mark actually stabbed Joan so hard that the knife actually snapped off within her body, splitting her bones, causing fragments of her bones to rupture. It was now 10 days after the killing of Claire, and just three days after the killing of Diane. When the parents became overwhelmed with Rory, because both girls had been missing for quite some time now, and it was completely unlike them both to disappear without a trace and without letting anybody know, and so both girls were reported missing to the police. Now I also just want to point out here that the smell of the decay that was coming from inside the house was now spilling out onto the street, and the neighbours were becoming quite irritable and quite concerned due to the smell. So the police were not only receiving reports from the Sanderson family, but they were also receiving reports from the local neighbours as well. Two police cars attended to Claire and Mark's flat, and after continuous knocking and banging on the door with no reply, the police decided to break down the door and to take a look inside. And that's when the police made the gruesome discovery of two bodies that were wrapped up in black bin bags and just dumped in the corner of the back room that were completely covered in bleach. As a guess, I think Mark did this in an attempt to prolong the first stages of the decomposing process. And I think he also did this in an attempt to wash away any DNA and fingerprints. I mean, it's just purely speculation, but yeah, that wouldn't make sense, I guess. Now, once the police informed the Sanderson family members that they had discovered both of the girls' bodies within the flat. The police were almost immediately called out to the Britons' family cottage home, and within just hours, they were able to link the four murders to Mark Hobson. The police didn't waste any time and immediately launched one of the biggest Yorkshire manhunts in criminal history. Claire Sanderson, Diane Sanderson, James Britton, and Joan Britton all had been butchered by the hands of Mark Hobson, who was now out there somewhere and on the run. And the police were still no closer in catching this dangerous and unpredictable killer. And so a live national TV appeal was made. The police were appealing to the general public asking if anybody knows who Mark is and where Mark might be, and asking them to contact the police immediately. The police were also showing the latest photo photographs of Mark, along with voice recordings of his mother, who was pleading and telling Mark to just hand himself in to the police. Today, at a news conference, senior officers played this tape-recorded message from his mother. Mark, the best thing you can do is to contact the police. If not the police, then a solicitor or someone who can help you. Days later, Mark Hobson's physical description, along with an up-to-date eFit photograph, was being shown on the TV news and in all the national newspapers. 
Yeah, it was a big thing. I mean, the police, they, they wanted this guy. They wanted him badly. And with it now being almost seven days after the killing of the Britons, the public in the York area were now becoming exceptionally fearful, as many members of the general public realised that, you know, anyone could potentially be next. And, and that's true. You stop to think about it. Mark Hobson would kill anybody that stood in his way, especially if it meant get in the way. The day was now the 25th of July in 2004 and the investigation was now fully underway, the largest manhunt ever seen on national TV. The police were now urging all members of the general public not to approach Mark if you see him out in public. Under any circumstances, don't approach him, don't try and grab him, just stay away from him and ring the police immediately as he was a dangerous man who was more than capable of murder. It's really crazy to think even with all of this huge media attention, including a huge police effort. Hobson was still out there, successfully evading capture. One thing police did speculate on was that the longer he remains uncaught, the more likely he is to seriously harm somebody or kill again. And the police were right to think that because during the time when he was on the run, Mark was writing yet another list. But this time it wasn't no shopping list. He'd actually wrote a list of people he was going to kill next. At the top of the list were Claire and Diane's parents, Mr and Mrs Sanderson, and and also the parents of his ex-wife purely because Mark believed his ex-wife's parents helped in taking away his kids. He'd also written down on a piece of paper the step-by-step -step actions he was going to take in carrying out these killings, and the plans were similar to the killings of Claire and Diane, involving brutal aggression, force, violence, and one large heavy hammer. Meanwhile, at the same time, the police were definitely by now feeling the pressure. They'd also put so much time and effort into their policing resources in trying to weed this murderer out, and yet still, no Nothing. Nothing at all. No positive news to give the unsettled public. So it's now been a full week and Mark Hobson is still out there on the run and by now he's feeling weak and tired. And so he decides to take a risk and come out from hiding, driven by hunger and desperate for food. And so he heads out to a very small and quiet country-like village called Shipton, which is just on the outskirts of York. And it was there in the village, he enters a petrol station to buy some food. However, Hobson didn't realise that the staff in the back office had recognised him. And while he was in the garage counting out his money and looking at what foods to buy, the staff were in the back office watching him on the CCTV. And they immediately recognised him from the TV news reports. And with that, they immediately rang the police. Hobson, believing that there's a lower chance of being identified in a small, quiet village, really did feed into his false sense of security. He was completely unaware that he had been recognised and when he left the petrol station with his sandwich and drink in his hand, it was literally within minutes police officers arrived on the scene and unbelievably one of the unit cars that were making their way to the scene had their sirens on, which of course indicated that there was a police presence in the area. Mark started freaking out at this point and he dives behind this water tank in an effort to avoid being seen and captured. The authorities, still sensing that Mark was still close by, began search in the area. Police officers began looking in residential gardens, checking around the back of the houses, and more and more police officers joined in the search efforts. Hobson was eventually found behind the petrol station, and he was hiding behind this strange-looking water tank. He was quickly put into cuffs, and finally, on the 25th of July, 34-year-old Mark Hobson was arrested on four counts of murder. Once he was put into police custody, Mark's barbaric reign of terror was finally over. He was responsible for the killing of four innocent people. And while being in police custody, he demonstrated a lack of respect and care, showing depravity at its finest. Unwilling to cooperate with police investigations, and when asked about the murders, Mark would simply deny all knowledge of the killings and still claim his innocence, really proving to law enforcement officers just how calculated, sadistic and callous he really was. He didn't care who he hurt, how many people he killed, and he never gave a single thought about his actions, and he certainly didn't care about the victims' families, who, I'll add, now have to live the rest of their life without seeing their loved ones again. He just, he, he didn't care, because he's a scumbag. And had the police not have caught him when they did, he would have no doubt gone on to take a further four more lives, as illustrated in his hit list that was found by police in his back pocket. And on April the 18th and 19th in 2005, Mark Hodson stood on the dock in Leeds Crown Court on trial for the murder of Claire and Diane Sanderson, both aged 27 years old, and Mr and Mrs Britton, who were both aged 
82. And once the court heard the descriptive detail and the manner in the way these killings were purposely planned and carried out, the people of the jury simply couldn't believe their ears. But what was clear was Hobson inflicted maximum horror, maximum pain and maximum suffering on all of his victims. In court, Hobson actually pleaded not guilty and blamed everything on drugs and his alcohol intake. And even as he stood in the Leeds Crown Court, he still wasn't able to admit or take any responsibility of his own destructive and savage actions. And that's when the police brought forward more incriminating evidence. One handwritten hit list containing the names of Claire and Diane's parents and the name of his ex-wife's parents. That along with step-by-step -step details on how he was planning on killing them. And after he finally realised he was just not going to be leaving this courtroom a free man, Mark Hobson eventually pleaded guilty to all four counts of murder. And on the 29th of April in 2005 at the Leeds City Crown Court, the judge sentenced Mark Hobson to serve the rest of his life behind bars at the Wakefield Prison with no chance of parole and no chance of release ever. Just after three months of being inside prison, Mark Hobson's extreme temper would bubble again to the surface as he attacked and poured boiling hot water over his cellmate, the Sowan murderer, Ian Huntley. Known for murdering Holly Wales and Jessica Chapman back in the August of 2002. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an episode for another day. <laughs> Hello there and thank you so much for watching yet another episode of When Evil Follows. If you have enjoyed today's case then please do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Your likes and views really go a long way in helping us out making these videos possible. And if you enjoy this type of content, we upload solved and unsolved cases every single week right here on this channel. Don't forget to hit the bell, that way you'll never miss out on any of our great up and coming videos just like this one. So Mark Hobson. Was he born evil or were drugs to blame? Is it really so impossible to believe that monsters exist? Either way, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And if you're still hungry for real horror crimes from the dark, here's two more videos guaranteed to make the cold shivers run up and down your spine. So go ahead and check them out. And as always, please stay safe, look after yourself and stay humble. And I'll see you next time when evil follows. Bye.